Our speaker for the first Nobel lecture this afternoon entered the field of ecology by an unlikely route. Robert May began his career as a theoretical physicist. After earning his BSc and PhD in theoretical physics from Sydney University, he lectured in applied mathematics at Harvard University for two years before returning to Sydney University as senior lecturer in theoretical physics. Then, in 1971, when he was at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, he began talking to the biologists at Princeton University and became intrigued by the theoretical problems of ecology. His new research interest led to the publication in 1973 of the influential book, Stability and Complexity in Model Ecosystems. At that time, many ecologists believed that the stability observed in many complex ecosystems was a consequence of the diversity of organisms in these natural communities. But May demonstrated that for a wide range of possible mathematical models for these systems, the likelihood of stability actually decreased as the complexity increased. So it appeared that in nature, something besides mere diversity was responsible for the observed stability. Robert May found a new home at Princeton, first as professor of zoology and later as chairman of the University Research Board, until 1988 when he moved to England, where he now holds the position of Royal Society Research Professor at Oxford University and Imperial College. Meanwhile, during his research in the mid-1970s, he had come to realize that models of nature, even very simple, albeit nonlinear, models, told a story different from a simple balance of nature. These models, and presumably nature likewise, could exhibit unpredictable long-run behavior. Thus, May became one of the pioneers of the new science of chaos. His current research still deals with the question of what influences the diversity and abundance of species, now focusing on the interactions between hosts and parasites from evolutionary and dynamical perspectives. For his work, he has received many honors and awards. He has been elected to the Royal Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Australian Academy of Sciences, the US National Academy of Sciences. He has won the Weldon Medal in Biometrics from Oxford University, the MacArthur Award of the American Ecological Society, the Zoological Society's inaugural Marsh Award for Conservation, and the Linnaean Society's Zoological Medal. Currently, he is chairman of the Board of Trustees of the, Nat of the Natural History Museum in London, a member of the Advisory Committee on Science and Technology to the United Kingdom Cabinet, and president of the British Ecological Society. Please join me in welcoming Professor Robert May to speak on causes and consequences of biological diversity. Down through the ages, most people have felt that the time in which they lived was special. The best of times, the worst of times, sometimes both together. These feelings are particularly acute at cusps in the calendar, the end of a decade, the end of a century, and especially the end of a millennium. So one must distrust people who come before you waving banners, talking about the end of the world as the millennium approaches. Having issued that caveat, I say to you that the time in which we live truly is singular. The increase in human numbers has finally, has finally come to the stage where it and its associated use of resources rivals in scale and scope by many objective measures the processes that built the biosphere as a place suited for life and which strive to maintain it. And one can measure that in terms of the atmospheric effects that George Woodwell spoke about so eloquently. One can measure it 
in terms of the amount of crucial elements like nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, that are mobilized now biologically as a result of human activities as distinct from natural processes. And it's interesting to think that scientific farming, which began not that long ago, 200 years or so, the first phosphate fertilizers came from some ingenious character who bought the rights to mine the Napoleonic battlefields of Europe for the decomposed phosphorus-rich bodies, and from that has built an increasingly successful scientific approach to agriculture, which in some disjunction with George, I think we benefit from, but one which nonetheless makes our impact on a scale of natural processes. The bottom line, as George told you, is perhaps in terms of the fraction of the globe's net primary productivity, the photons that are captured from the sun by plants. And we can argue about the details. Is it 25%, is it 40%, is it 50% that are sequestered to human use? But whether it's a half or whether it's a quarter, never in all the history of life on Earth has one species captured anything like such a fraction. Never has one genus, one family, never has one major taxon captured anything like such a fraction of the net primary productivity. This is the result, the end product, of an extraordinarily complicated story of population growth, which itself, which itself is in my mind a triumphant story of challenge and response, of change of the environment and adaptation to it. A change which reaches through three major revolutionary phases, from the hunter-gatherer phase in which humans persisted for the better part of a million years, at population densities overall globally probably never exceeding a total of five million. And then some 10,000 years ago, we saw the dawn of the agricultural revolution as people began to cultivate crops, aggregate in larger and larger units in the so-called fertile crescent, Tigris Euphrates, which in 5,000 years ago held more people than it does today in the Nile Valley, the Indus, other places. And that saw a rapid leap in human numbers from five million over the next 10,000 years, perhaps a 20-fold increase in the first 5,000 years, and then as disease and the lower nutritional standards often associated with uh, towns bit into it, a factor five in the second 5,000 years, to get to around half a billion, 500 million, at the dawn of the scientific industrial revolution some few hundred years ago. That was factor 100 increase in our, in our numbers over a span of about 10,000 years, a doubling roughly once, a cent, once every thousand years. From the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, one has seen the ever-accelerating growth of human numbers, which George described to you. And he described to you equally literally, intuitively unimaginable rate at which we add people today. To the surface of the globe, in the course of the next 20 minutes, will be added a number of people equal to the total contents of this hall. And that may not seem like much. Another Gustavus Adolphus College, roughly, worth of people in the next 20 minutes you add that and you add that and you add that and you're into numbers we can't wrestle with. A quarter of a million a day, a hundred million a year. And the result of that is that we stand on the crest of a breaking wave. As an Australian who saw too much of the crests of breaking waves in youth, that's more than a poetic image. It's an uncomfortable place to be. That's where we and the rest 
evolutionary history of life on Earth stands today. On the crest of a breaking wave of impending extinction that surely will rival in scale and scope the great extinction spasms that mark the discontinuities in the fossil record. The great extinctions that mark the end of the Permian, the beginning of the Triassic, the gap that conventionally marks the Paleozoic from the Mesozoic, the old age of life from the Middle Age, the great extinctions at the end of the Cretaceous that are more in public consciousness this day. Jurassic Park more technically ought to be called Cretaceous Park, yet it has less of a resonance, uh, though velociraptors, I regret to tell you, are Cretaceous. The great spasms of extinction that swept the world at the end of those epochs from natural events will probably were not as significant as what we face and they surely took place over a longer time. And it's very difficult for us to deal with this. There's a book written at the end of the 60s by Reggie Debray called Revolution in the Revolution, which is a book I held no brief for. I think it's mainly rubbish. But it has an extraordinarily resonant poetic opening paragraph, which speaks to our circumstance, our inability to see and deal with this real revolution. Reggie Debray says, we are never contemporaneous with our own present. History advances in disguise. It appears on scene wearing the it appears on stage wearing the mask of the preceding scene. And we tend to lose the meaning of the play. The fault, of course, is not history's, but it lies in our vision, encumbered with memories and images learned in the past. We see the past superimposed on the present, even when the present is a revolution. The revolution we stand on the edge of can perhaps be over-dramatized, but I think it is accurate to say it is a revolution that borders from the point of view of an evolutionary biologist of being the end of biological history. Unlike George Woodwell, I am a technological optimist. I do not fear for our survival. I believe we are clever enough that we will come through. It is the rest of creation that I am addressing my talk to. And in the rest of this talk, I will first briefly discuss with you how many species we think there are on Earth today how many we've catalogued and we actually know about, how many we think there may be in total. And against that background, I will turn to talk with you about our thoughts and our great uncertainties about the future. This is not the talk I plan to give. I came encouraged by a lively and engaging correspondence with Dr. Seip to give a more scholarly talk about the dynamic character of natural systems. I came into this hall last night. This is a hall for a revival meeting. This is not a hall. <laughs> this is not a hall for a scholarly discourse. The extraordinarily conscientious man who presides over the showing of the slides was rather shocked at the number and technical nature of those I had. And I, have, I am giving a different and slightly more from the heart, though I still assert deeply and analytically from the head, talk than the more scholarly one uh, that you were scheduled to hear. And to that end, I shall now... <laughs> the task systematically of cataloging and recording the plants and animals that we share the world with was begun very recently. The standard date would be 1758, the 10th edition of Linnaeus's Catalogue of Species. Linnaeus recognized some 9,000 species. But that date itself is an extraordinary date. 
that date is a full century after Newton. A hundred years earlier, Newton, building on centuries of work, which is essentially the taxonomy and systematics of stars and planets, had given us not merely an organization of the catalog of life out there, of life of stars and planets, but a law that underlay it. And that analytic predictive understanding came a century before we turned our attention to similar looking at the creatures we share the world with. And that legacy of Linnaeus versus Newton lingers with us today as we spend in a year maintain the budget for maintaining the Hubble telescope. A romantic enterprise with which I have every sympathy and an encouraging enterprise because the way it's screwed up is an encouragement to all biologists. <laughs> we spend more on maintaining that failed instrument and the maintenance costs in one year than we spend on the entire enterprise in the United States of collecting, recognizing, codifying the creatures we share the world with. In the years since Linnaeus, different groups have received different degrees of attention. And there will not be an exam on this slide, but it's to give a rough impression. Along the x-axis, from your, running from your left to your right as you face it, is time since Linnaeus, with at the left, 1758, and at the right, 1970, which is when this piece of work was done. And up the y-axis, running vertically, is the fraction of all birds that were known by 1970 that had been named and recognized in the years after Linnaeus. It's not actually the number, it's the logarithm of the number. But the pattern is clear. The line running along below the top horizontal line gives you the point at which half the birds catalogued by 1970 had been named and recorded. And you see, it took less than 100 years after Linnaeus when we knew half the birds, and 100 years ago we were close to having all of them, and that's a pretty steady pattern. It's a remarkable contrast with the pattern of naming and recording arthropods other than insects, essentially spiders and crustaceans. And here you see a very different pattern. Linnaeus recognized few. There was a spurt of growth in the 19th century. But essentially half of all those named and recorded up to 1970 had been named and formally recorded in the decade preceding. Very different patterns for different groups. Today, we still find new bird species, and believe me, it is an epochal event in the life of those who find them. And, uh, the romantic image that that carries will be manifest on this podium tomorrow in the uh, corpus of Jared Diamond, one of the true romantics of our time. Bird species still turn up at the rate of three to five a year. They're due pretty inconspicuous little brown things, ant wrens and whatnot, but nonetheless big in the life of those that find them. Mammals turn up at the rate of maybe five to ten species, maybe one genus a year, although it's a bit cloudy because some of it is not so much a genuine discovery as reclassification. Plants, if a tropical biologist comes back from the Amazon, characteristically about one in a hundred of the plants that come back will be new to science. A good estimate, most botanists would agree, that we currently recognize some 250, 270,000 species of vascular plants, and maybe the total may be like 300,000. We know them to within 10, 15%. You go to a new region and look at the invertebrates, look at the insects, look at the creepy crawlies, come back, go through the enormous labor of identifying them by species if they've been named, an enormous labor because we have no centralized records, no computerized keys for identifying them. But when you do that enormous labor, as few people have done, you find typically a half or two-thirds of the collection is new to science. 
You see the same in publications. If you were a species, you might measure your status, uh, if you were a scholarly creature, by the number of papers that were published about you each year. Then if you're a vertebrate, if you're a bird or a mammal, a furry or a feathery, you'll get about a paper a year. If you're a fish or amphibian reptile, you'll get about half a paper a year. But if you're invertebrate, you'll be lucky to get a tenth and you'll more characteristically get a hundredth of a paper a year. If you ask how the taxonomists are distributed among the organisms they're studying, if you look at the taxonomy of taxonomists, <laughs> roughly speaking, the patterns are similar in this country, in Britain, and in Australia, which are the three places that I and some colleagues have studied. You find roughly a third work on plants, roughly a third work on vertebrates, and roughly a third work on invertebrates. A few work on microorganisms and fossils. Then you ask about the magnitude of the groups they study. There are about 40,000 species of vertebrates, and that's probably a good number. About 300,000 species of vascular plants, reasonable number. And of invertebrates, as I shall explain in a moment, we have a very vague idea. Maybe three million. That would be a most people's a low guess. So you've got roughly equal division of the labor force, plants, vertebrates, invertebrates, and yet the number of species is 40,000, 300,000, 3 million. One, mag one order of magnitude difference, vertebrates to plants, in the level of effort, two orders of magnitude, vertebrates to invertebrates. No wonder we know so little about them. If this were a business, and the accountants were to look at the way it was organized, they would be appalled. So what is the overall total? The slide that has been on the screen while I've been talking attempts to give a picture of the way the roughly 1.8 million recorded catalogued species are distributed among the, more, the broad taxonomic groups. The big insecty thing in the top right is insects. More than half the recorded species, roughly one million of them, are insects. To a good first approximation, everything's an insect. Those with acute eyesight at the back and those sitting in the front may see in the middle a little elephant who stands for the 40,000 vertebrates, and so it goes. It's a picture very dissonant with our image of it all. The insects are the far away the most abundant group, and among them, the beetles are the most abundant. Roughly 300, maybe 400,000 species of recorded beetles. Someone once asked Haldane, a famous evolutionary biologist, uh, what his studies of the natural world led him to understand of the nature of the creator. And Haldane said, an inordinate fondness for beetles. Although there are roughly 1.8 million catalog, many of these are the same thing that have been given different names at different times. And there's a problem of synonyms, same name for the, different names for the same creature, that still and ever will be sort, being sorted out. Rough estimates are that synonymy may account for about 20% of recorded species, and so allowing for that should have more like one and a half million species named and recorded. The simple fact, the number of species that have been named, that's a factual question. It is symptomatic of the underfunding and the curious intellectual history dating back to Linnaeus and beyond that has focused our imagination outward to the stars and inward to the center of the nucleus, but not around us to the things we share the world with. It is symptomatic of that that I cannot tell you how many species have been named and recorded. There is no central catalog. 
there is a central catalogue for every book in the Library of Congress, for every book in the British Museum, comparable numbers. But for the books of life, as the smoke swirls above the Amazon, we are burning those books faster than we read them. So how many species may there be in total? The conventional estimate is maybe three to five million, maybe two yet to be found for every one we've found. That comes from projecting past trends. It comes from surveying the opinion of experts. It comes from a simple intuitive argument that's easily grasped that says, in the well-known groups, in the romantic birds and mammals, roughly speaking, for every one species in temperate or northerly, southerly regions, there are two in the tropics. The great majority of recorded species are insects and other invertebrates, and they're mainly not in the tropics, because the people, the generations of British clergy that worked on them don't live there. So if it is true for them, as it is for the better known vertebrates, that there are two in the tropics for every one in other regions, we can expect a rough doubling or trebling, hence one half million goes to three to five. And that's a number that's reasonably consistent with the kinds of information that comes that I mentioned earlier by people who go carefully and study a particular group in a new place, like uh, Hodkinson and Casson from Liverpool Polytechnic, who went to Sulawesi in the sort of in the Indonesian archipelago, as it were, and looked at the bugs, the hemipterans on trees there for a year and more, brought them back, and then spent years keying them out and identifying them. 1,700 species they found, two-thirds, 63%, were new to science. If that's characteristic of other groups, again, every one you know, there are two you don't. Or another kind of inference. In Britain, there are something like 66 species of butterflies. Rather pathetic number, but there it is. Globally, there are something like 20,000 species of butterflies, and they're fairly well known. That's a pre pretty good number. Butterflies are a kind of honorary bird. Overall in Britain, where again the fauna is extremely well known, comparatively speaking, there are something like 22,000 species of insects. So if the ratio 66 butterflies to 22,000 insects for Britain is representative of the more general 20,000 species of butterflies for X insects, we deduce that X is about 5 million. And the trouble with that kind of uh, argument is you can't be sure that what is true of one group or one place is true of another group or another place. Another style of argument that has been particularly influential and widely cited and in my opinion, extremely important in prompting a fresh look, is work by Terry Irwin at the Smithsonian Institution and others, looking at the canopies of tropical trees. Different national groups do this differently. Canopies of tropical trees, they're a, they're a long way up there and they haven't been looked at much until recently. Different national groups reveal national characters in the way they go about this. The French do it romantically with balloons and they waft over and pop down. The Americans, with sort of brutal technological realism, build a dirty big crane in bar up down in Panama and go whipping around. And the British, with true praiseworthy empiricism, use insecticidal fogs that knock things down <laughs> and collect them. Irwin, recognizing the virtue of a superior culture when he saw it, borrowed this technique and he found that in the canopy of a typical tropical tree species, there were something like 1,200, 1,000, give or take, different species of beetle. Irwin has never yet keyed them out to see what fraction are known to science and what not. That's a huge labor. Instead, he has used a fascinating and ecologically revealing chain of theoretical argument to pyramid from 
a thousand species of beetle in one tree to an estimate of the global total of insects. Now the first thing obviously you've got to ask is if I find a thousand beetles in the canopy of one tree species and in the region I'm looking at there are a hundred different kinds of trees, am I going to see different beetles on every one to get a total of 10,000 beetle species? Or am I going to see the same ubiquitous beetles on every wretched tree? A thousand beetles no matter how many tree species. Irwin answers that by saying roughly, effectively, roughly, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the beetles are effectively specialized to a tree. Or to put it another way, each beetle species on average roughly is to be found on a total of 5 to 10 different tree species. So effectively speaking, there are, as it were, about 100 to 200 beetle species in the canopy of each tree species particular to it. And then you say, well, 40% of all insects are beetles, and if that's generally true, if we've got 40 beetles, we've got 100 insects. If we've got 160 beetles, we've got about 400 insects in the canopy. And then you make a guess, if we've got 100 in the canopy, we've got another 50 elsewhere on the tree. You go from 400 in the canopy to 600 in total. 600 insects effectively specialized per tree. We've got maybe 50,000 different tree species, kinds of trees in the tropic. 50,000 times 600, 30 million. That's a dramatic estimate, but it's really an agenda for research, not a number. And I may say my estimate of that, I would take strong issue with Irwin's sharing five trees, 20% effective specialization. I'd say it's more like two to one that each species is more likely to share 50 to 100 trees, and that cuts that number back to 3 million, not to get it in agreement with the other numbers, but because that's what I would believe by comparison with better known insects on oaks in Britain. On the other hand, I'd say there are more in the bottom of the tree than the top, than Irwin says, but he's a canopy chauvinist. His work is important for focusing on how little we know and it is also important in showing how an estimate of how many species there really are, the heirs to evolution, an estimate can't be disentangled from fundamental ecological questions that I could be giving the lecture about on what determines degrees of specialization, and why there are more species in the tropics than in the temperate region, and what you might expect to be the ratio canopy to the roots focuses on gender, and it prompts other reinvestigations. Fungi, for fungi in the broad sense, something like 70,000 species are recognized. But in Britain, where both the plants and the fungi are well known, there are roughly seven species of fungi for every plant species. There are admittedly not many plant species in Britain, which is deep pauperate as a result of the last ice age, but forget that for the moment. If there really are seven species of fungi for each species of vascular plant, and we recognize 300 species of vascular plant, then there's one and a half million odd species of fungi. And that again focuses on how little we know, although again I don't like the estimate for two reasons. Firstly, Britain is particularly rich in fungi, being a small, damp place, and particularly poor in vascular plants, having only about 1,200 of them. And secondly, I think that the, well, let's not get too technical. It, it, it points to what we don't know in that direction. And yet again, there are revisionist estimates of the amount of creatures in the deep ocean bottom. If we ask how many of known and recorded species dwell in the sea versus the land, the answer is only about 15%, only about one in seven. And that's odd because two thirds or more of the surface of the earth is covered in ocean. 71% of the surface of the earth is ocean, and yet it only contains a seventh of the species. And there are revisionist estimates that suggest the ocean bottom is much richer than we had guessed. And again, I, I'm obviously a slightly more conservative bloke, 
I think they're a little over the top, those estimates, but I still am sure that there are three to four species in the ocean bottom, unrecognized, unwept, unhonored, unsung for every one that we've recorded. In addition to these factual estimates, some of them direct, some of them linked by tenuous chains of ecological inference, there are even more frankly theoretical estimates. Estimates that which themselves derive from the answers to yet unsolved fundamental problems in basic ecological research. One such is the structure of food webs. Are there general patterns in the numbers of plants, the number of herbivores that eat the plants, the number of carnivores that eat the herbivores that eat the plants, the number of the, and so on. Is every food web unique and different and incomprehensible? Or are there broad patterns? And the answer, of course, is a bit of both. There are, there are differences, there are differences, and there are complications, but there also are broad patterns. One such broad pattern is that most species are connected by trophic links, by relations of eating or being eaten to only three, four, five other species or distinct groups of species, trophic species, groups of things that can be identified as a parcel, all of which eat and are eaten by things they're connected to. And that's true in the sea, on land, in productive and in unproductive environments. There's a very rough, a very raggedy, a many exceptions to it kind of order of magnitude generalization that says in plant animal communities in Europe, in North America, in the tropics, in wet places, in dry places, characteristically, give or take a factor of two or three, sometimes four or five, for every plant species there are roughly ten animal species. Now, we don't understand the sources of that relation. We have the beginnings of trying to understand what might set the rule and what might govern the many different forms it takes and the trends and the exceptions. But broadly speaking, if we had that number, interestingly and quite independently, again, it would say the fairly secure number of roughly 300,000 species of plants implies 10 times that many three million species of animals. And I give it both because the number is interesting and because it's another link between the basic theory and its empirical expression. Another approach which I touch on briefly, again highly theory laden, is to look at patterns in the number of species in different categories of body size. And here I show the world's 9,000 species of birds up the vertical y-axis, top to bottom, is number of species in a logarithmic scale, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 right at the top, and there's none of them. And along the x-axis, going from your left to your right, is the weight of the bird on a logarithmic scale, so that equal intervals along that scale correspond to equal multiples of weight. And you'll see there's a broad pattern. As you go from bigger birds, as you move to smaller and smaller body sizes, you get more species in each body size, and the, the dashed line represents a rough trend that says, go down a factor 10 in length, and you find a hundred times more species until eventually you get too small to be a bird. The same sort of broad pattern is true for the world's 3,000 species of mammals that aren't bats, taking away the thousand bats. The same pattern is true for British beetles, the roughly three, three to four thousand species of British beetles, logarithm of the numbers, logarithm of the length, you go down a factor 10 in characteristic length from centimeter beetles to millimeter beetles and you pick up 100 more species at the big end, but at the low end it just tends to fall over. And what if we put that together for all 
terrestrial animals, from elephants through horses, dogs, down to earwigs and ants and fleas and mites. Interestingly, we again see that broad pattern at the high end over three orders of magnitude, down from 10 meters to a meter, 100 centimeters, 10 centimeters, down almost beyond below the centimeter range, go down a factor 10 in characteristic length, 100 more species, until you get down into the sub-centimeter, millimeter range, and it begins to turn over. Again, there's a fundamental and fascinating question there. What gives us this rule? Could it be, a suggestion made by MacArthur and Hutchinson, could it be that creatures see the world, a world with many different roles to be filled, that they see the world as patchy and structured on a scale that is keyed to their own physical size? And so as you get smaller, you in effect see more world in a way that scales as your own apparent perception of the surface area of the world, in which case the number of, as it were, niches or ways of using that texture would increase inversely like the square on your length. More recent investigations would complicate that with notions of fractal geometry, but roughly you might get a rule like that. Whatever the explanation, it's an empirical rule that stretches over three to four orders of magnitude and breaks down as you enter the region of the little unromantic insects that have received relatively little attention. If I were to project that rule down to the millimeter size class, I would pick up in the unfilled area in the top left of the screen, I would pick up an extra tripling, quadrupling of the number of species for an estimate of 5 to 10 million species of terrestrial animals. I may say that that slide also holds the answer to Noah's problem with the ark. Many people think that Noah couldn't have uh, actually got all the animals on the ark because there are so many little ones. But if you think about that rule, you build a cage for the big ones, you know, a sort of meter cube cage, and now we move down a factor of 10 to the 10 centimeter cages, okay? Each 10 centimeter cage is a thousandth the volume of the one meter cage, so we can get a thousand 10 centimeter cages. In the region, we have one meter cage, but there are only 100 more species in this lower range. So to bring on board the next smallest category of species only takes up a tenth the air volume and allowing for the cage stacking effects, which might complicate it a bit. Uh, basically, there isn't a problem in getting all the little things on. The real problem is getting on just the big ones, which unfortunately was an insuperable problem, which could be solved only by magic. I have a few footnotes to all of that before I turn to the question of extinctions. Firstly, you will notice I have actually skipped over what I mean by a species. And this is really important. I've also skipped over the microorganisms. I've not slid down to protozoa, to algae, to bacteria, to viruses. And part of the reason is I believe the whole species concept differs as we do so. For the difference, in fact, in the molecular sequence of what we conventionally call two different strains of the Legionnaire's disease bacterium, Legionella, what we call two different strains of the same species, if we're a bacteriologist, are more different in their molecular sequences than the characteristic difference between a fish and a bird. So we mean different things. And by the time we're down to viruses, we really talk about species swarms or quasi-species. The concept is different. It may also be that the geographical ranges of smaller things are much greater. So there's another fascinating question relevant to conservation design and relevant also to changing habitats in response to changing climate as to what are the characteristic ranges of different creatures 
And are there patterns in the characteristic range in relation to characteristic body size? And it may well be that there's an interesting sort of U-shaped pattern with big creatures tending to have big geographical ranges, smaller creatures, smaller ranges, and very tiny things like protozoa, again, having very big ranges. And this, again, is a point where fundamental ecological theory and ignorance intersects with taxonomic questions about conservation. But at the same time, and in a manner which is more in the domain of the philosopher who will speak to you later, how much we care is fascinatingly bound in with how big things are. So that our concern, understandably, our concern is focused on the romantic furries and featheries. It's much harder to raise money for the odd insect. There's no society for the preservation of nematodes. And as you slide down to the bacteria and viruses, Probably next year, we will celebrate the deliberate extinction of the smallpox virus. So not merely does our concern diminish, it changes sign. And there are very interesting and unresolved philosophical questions there that I will hurry on past. I've also given a discussion which is very focused at species. Different patterns Interestingly, important different patterns emerge if I look at different and higher taxonomic levels. I said only one in seven of recorded species is in the ocean, but if I look at the level of phylum, the highest taxonomic unit, the phylum that embraces all the chordates, for example, I would recognize 33 metazoan, roughly animal phyla. Of that 33 phyla, 33 different basic body plans, as it were. 33 real evolutionary novelties. 32 are found in the ocean. Only 12 are found on land. Or to put it another way, only one is found only on the land, and 21 are found only in the ocean. At the level of basic evolutionary novelty, the oceans still reflect more the far distant past and show much greater fundamental evolutionary diversity, even though largely thanks to the insects, the insects and their specialized relation with flowering plants, six-sevenths of all recognized species are terrestrial. And more broadly, biological diversity doesn't even necessarily mean in species or phyla. It reaches down below that to recognize the genetic diversity within a species from which it derives the evolutionary novelty, the raw stuff of evolution is that variation. The raw stuff of our biotechnology future is in that genetic diversity within populations. And the biological diversity reaches above to embrace ecosystems and their structure and function in terms of the constituent species and their interactions. I have explained to you how we know, not to within 10%, how many species have been actually named and recorded. Not to within an order of magnitude how many species there may be. Even less, even less can we give hard answers to current and impending extinction rates. The slide before you is a corner of the Bronx Zoo which has the headstones of extinct species, creatures that have gone extinct in the last 100, 200 years. These are upper middle class species that got a formal death certificate. And nearly all birds and mammals Even there, the rate is not high. Roughly 200, 300 species of vertebrates, mainly birds and mammals, have been recorded certified extinct in the last few hundred years. 
roughly one species of bird and mammal per year over the, in this century. There are about 9,000 plus 4,000, about 13,000 species of birds and mammals. One recorded extinction a year means, on average, roughly speaking, those species at current extinction rates, if those rates are accurate, can expect a life of about 10,000 years, which sounds like a long time. It has to be read against the background rate that the average animal expects a life in the fossil record of about 10 million years. So those times, long they, they, though they may seem, are a thousand times faster than background. Equally certainly, however, those numbers are meaningless. Not only is it a fact that to have a death certificate for a tombstone in that, century, in that cemetery, you have to satisfy criteria that few unglamorous remote tropical species would satisfy. But many of the things that we know would be extinct otherwise are in fact clinging on because we've identified them as threatened and they're hanging on as the romantic furries and featheries in zoos and nature reserves. The real rate can't be deduced well from that. What we can do, it's a slightly better, now you're not supposed to be reading the slide. This is, there's not a slide, it just says I can read it on my screen here, because I forgot to bring it with me. We can instead ask to categorize those species that are not certified extinct as probably extinct, or in a technical sense, endangered by technical, bureaucratic, suit coat jacketed requirements that are necessary for the implementation of treaties like the trade in endangered animals. There's another category below that, vulnerable. These are things where we would, endangered, we would, protect, we would project the extinction within a century if nothing changes. Under that criterion, roughly 10% of all birds and mammals are listed. Fewer, three to two percent, reptiles, amphibians, and fish, and a ludicrous less than a tenth of a percent of insects. So those numbers tell us more, again, about the taxonomy of taxonomists, about the efficiencies of data recording, about where our emotions are, not where the extinction patterns are. And it forces us to turn to more theoretical estimates of extinction rates and then come back and compare them against the facts. The most common theoretical projection, which is the basis of essentially any number you have read, is based on documented studies of the different number of species on islands of different sizes, either real islands in an archipelago or virtual islands as mountain tops uh, in a plain. The relation between number of species in different areas and the, and the area. And there's a rough rule. The rule says go down a factor 10 in area, lose half the species. At the margin, it says lose a small fraction x of the area. You lose a smaller fraction, a quarter x, roughly, of the species. That's an empirical rule. It is, I add, underpinned by some rather nice and elegant and I think believable theory that illuminates it. But it's basically an empirical generalization with the usual exceptions and certain problems of applying it when the areas are recently fragmented rather than a natural archipelago. Be that as it may, we have that rule. And we can convolve it with one other fact. Tropical forests are disappearing at the rate of and again, people argue, a little less than 1% a year, 2% a year, somewhere in the range, 1% to 2% a year is the current rate, the establishment agreed current rate of tropical deforestation. So if we're losing 1% to 2% of the forest, we're losing a quarter of that, a quarter to a half a percent of the species. We're turning that upside down, the characteristic life expectancy from that argument of a tropical species as a result 
of tropical forest destruction is the inverse of a quarter to half a percent gone each year, 200 to 400 years. Now that 200 to 400 years is dissonant with the 10,000 years I just gave you from the recorded extinctions. But as I said, the problem is there are so many species that are probably extinct but have not yet got their certificate. And there are some interesting, recent, careful examinations. For example, that species area projection would say, we are committed now, we are committed outside preservation in a zoo to lose, by the middle of the next century, by 2050, about 1,500 bird species. Then you look at those red data figures that you couldn't see on the slide I didn't show. It lists about 1,100 in the category endangered or vulnerable or probably extinct by the apparatchik's criteria, which is sensible, that are, by that definition, committed to probable extinction by 2050. And you look at that more carefully and you say, looking at that evidence really more carefully, as Vernon Haywood has just done at the Botanic Gardens Conservation International, Maybe the real number is 500 would seem to him, on a conservative estimate, to be committed to extinction by the middle of the next century, and that number's not very different from the species area 1500. They're in the same ballpark, factor three different. Georgina Mace, one of the principal common sense architects of the criteria that govern the categories of threat for the CITES treaty, endangered species, recently looked at about 800 threatened mammals an estimated 43% of them committed to extinction by the middle of the next century. Yet another estimate by one of my students and myself recently takes those categories from not threatened through vulnerable, the first rung on the ladder, endangered, the next rung on the ladder, probably extinct, the next rung on the ladder, extinct, the fourth rung. And it looks at the rate at which over the last decade or so, birds, mammals and unusually well studied among plants, palm trees have climbed that ladder and projecting from that to ask, well then how long on average to go from the bottom to the top for the average bird, mammal, palm species? The answer is again by that entirely different argument. 100 to 300 years for the birds and mammals, 70 to 150 for the palm trees. Those numbers are beset, as I have emphasized, with many problems and uncertainties, but they are in accord. The empirical facts, the species area theories, the ladder climbing estimates, at seeing the next century as a time that could well see an accelerating loss of half of all that we have inherited 600 million years of evolution. I conclude with two thoughts. First, it is often portrayed that this is a problem of the tropics. I'm not as conversant as I should be with the United States, but I can tell you this in Britain, an unusually well-studied place. There are some five and a half thousand sites of special scientific interest, SSSIs, designated as such, some big, some small, they add up to about 5% of the United Kingdom, and they receive protection, but not statutory definitive protection. Establishment estimates, the government's own white paper on the environment, Conventional estimates, establishment estimates of their rate of destruction range from 1% a year to 5% a year. That's like the tropical forest. The British insect fauna is, as I said earlier, unusually well studied. 1% of the British insects, 1% of the British invertebrates other than insects have gone extinct this century. Not globally extinct, but extinct in Britain. And 7% of the British invertebrates, both insects and other than insects, are in the categories endangered or vulnerable. They're in the categories of threat. That's not very different from birds and mammals when you know the fauna. And that's in Britain. 
These problems are not problems of the tropics. They're not problems for us comfortably here in gracious places like this to anguish about in what is ultimately a condescending way. And I conclude by reading to you something that Aldo Leopold wrote, not a long way from here, actually, in Cincinnati. And he spoke of the passing of the passenger pigeon. The last passenger pigeon, Martha was her name, is stuffed in the uh, cabinets in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, and there's a mournful little plaque that records her passing in 1917. No such plaque will mourn, as I said, the passing of the last smallpox virus. But thinking of the passenger pigeon, Aldo Leopold said, we grieve because no living man will see again the onrushing phalanx of victorious birds sweeping a path for spring across the March skies, chasing the defeated winter from all the woods and prairies. Our grandfathers, who saw the glory of the fluttering hosts, were less well-housed, well-fed, well-clothed than we are. The strivings by which they bettered our lot are also those which deprived us of pigeons. Perhaps we now grieve because we are not sure in our hearts that we have gained by the exchange. But the truth is that our grandfathers who did the actual killing were our agents. They were our agents in the sense that they shared the conviction which we have only now begun to doubt, that it is more important to multiply people multiply comforts than to cherish the beauty of the land in which they live.